from Studio D. Welcome to Dove Point Bible Study, and we're so glad you joined us. Today's lecture is Satan's Locust Army, Part 8, Be Prepared, God's Promise to His Elect. And this lesson will be about what God's election can expect, okay, through that final five-month period of flesh just before the return of Christ, having to do with our mindset, okay, through this period, and having to do with our provisions. And we will begin in the great book of Joel, chapter 2. So, if you would, the, the uh, great book of Joel is back towards the latter part of the Old Testament, uh, right next to Amos. So, if you'll go ahead and turn there. And uh, while you're getting there, the word Joel, it's important to know what these words mean. Joel in the Hebrew language means Yahovah is God. Okay? No ifs. No ands and no buts about it. Yahovah is God. And the subject of this entire book is the Lord's Day, which is the second coming of Christ. And it gives you the events, okay, that precede His coming, which pertains to the generation you and I live in. So it's current to us right now. In this lecture, Satan's locust army has already approached. They're on the ground and their five-month period has begun. That's the time frame we're in in this chapter of Joel chapter 2. And we're going to begin in verse 15. So if you will, look down that way. The prophet begins in verse 15 to give us these instructions, okay, as to what you should do and what you can expect when you see these events come to pass. Now, in case you don't know, maybe this is the first time you've ever tuned in, okay? This five-month period is the 42 months of the uh, tribulation of the Antichrist that Christ shortened to five months. So we're going to be talking, when you're talking this five-month period, and you're listening to this lecture, you're really listening to the tribulation of Antichrist. What happens? Who the players are? When it happens? Why it happens? Where it happens? All that. So uh, the prophet begins to give God's people, okay? He gives us our instructions, I'm going to say it one more time, as to what we should do and what we can expect when we see these events come to pass. And it begins with God's remnant, that's His election, that's His people on the ground, sounding alarm. Look at verse 15. Yahweh tells us, Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, not a feast, but a fast, and call forth a day of restraint. What does that mean? It means, man, <laughs> it's time to stop what you're doing, take a time out, look around you, and listen, and see what's happening around you, and then and sanctify a fast and call a solemn assembly. Why? It's time to get serious right here. And why are we getting serious? Because in chapter 1, if you go back to the very first lecture in this series, the prophet said, the prophet Joel said, there has never been a day in the history of man like this one that we're going into, nor will there ever be again. We're privileged to live in this generation. And that's the truth. So he said, sound the alarm. Blow the trumpet. Why? The day of the Lord is at the end door. Do not alter your course. Stick to God's Word. Okay? So, we sound the alarm. That's what He wants us to do. Then verse 16, what's the next thing we do? He says, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, and even those that suck the breast, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber, and the bride out of her closet, this is the marriage supper of the Lamb here we're talking about, and it is time for a wedding, yes. But it's also obvious that God wants His whole family present for this particular special wedding, okay? From the youngest baby up to the oldest living elder. He wants them all there. <clears throat> Verse 17. Then He says, let the priest, the ministers of the Lord, I'm not talking about the devil's 
you know, false apostles and prophets and all those. We're talking about the ministers of the Lord on the ground at that time. Here's what he tells them. He says, weep between the porch and the altar. Well, where's that? That's between the people and the altar of God. And let them say to God, let the people say to God, spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine, inherit their, thine heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. You see, this army's on its way. And the preachers are, you know, the real ones are crying, you know, hey, spare your people, God. Give not thine heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. <clears throat> Finish the verse. Wherefore should they, our enemies, among the people, where is their God? Oh, they want to know, scoffers are you? Okay. Now, these particular ministers of the Lord, going into this five months, are those who have spiritual eyes to see, spiritual ears to hear, and they are very familiar with the signs of the time, recognizing the season of His return. In other words, they have <clears throat> that prophetic understanding. And right here, my friend, there is no substitute for that understanding. You need to understand Bible prophecy. Then what happens? Verse 18. Then will the Lord be jealous. Yeah, He's a jealous God. He's jealous over His children, just like you are yours. Then will the Lord be jealous for His land and pity His people. You know, He's going to take care of them. And it is those two things right there, okay? The dividing of His land and the terrible treatment that God's people have suffered through all these, you know, millennia. These are the two things that rise God to jealousy, which rises to a fury, which rises to an anger, which rises to a vengeance just before His return. These are the two things. You and His land. That's why He's jealous. And from Revelation 15 and verse 3, we cover this in the last lecture. Those that overcome the beast system and the beast himself, okay, are going to sing a song, the Bible tells us, as they exit the flesh age and march into the age of the Spirit. What song is that? The song they're going to sing is the song of Moses. And it's found in Deuteronomy 32. <clears throat> and verse 18 in Joel chapter 2, we just read it, is a quote. He's quoting the very last verse in the Song of Moses, which is Deuteronomy 32 and verse 43. So you see the connection here? And the last eight verses, you should read them this week. The last, <coughs> excuse me, the last eight verses of the Song of Moses, they sum up the object and the outcome of of all of the events which go to make up the Lord's day. That's right. In the Old Covenant, you read that. That's why you need a basic understanding of the Torah if you really want to understand the Gospels. Make no mistake about it, my friend. The welding of these two verses from Revelation 15 and Deuteronomy uh, 32 is no coincidence. It's just not. Verse 19. Yay, or yes, the Lord will answer and say unto His people. Let me add this. When we pray fervently and earnestly, of course. Okay? Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil. Keep in mind now, we're talking about the tribulation. Say, so, yeah, I'm going to hear you. I'll hear you when you call. And I'm going to send you, oh, woe and misery. That ain't what he said. Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and you shall be satisfied therewith. And I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen nations. It won't go past here. It's going to stop right here. <clears throat> I'm having a little bit of 
frog in my voice here, so let's have a little drink here. You want to have a little uh, water break here with me? We're going to do a little toast to life. Lekheim to life. Amen. So you can see right here in verse 19 that he's going to fully satisfy our needs through this five-month period. And isn't that what he did through the Exodus? Is it? Sure it is. Verse 20, But I will remove far off from you the northern army. Now who's this northern army? Ta-da! It's the locust army. He said, I'm going to get rid of them. That's what he's telling you. I will remove far off from you the northern army. That's the locust army. And I will drive them. Don't sound like he's gently leading them to me. He says, I will drive them into the land barren and desolate with his face toward the east sea. That'd be the dead sea in Israel. And his hinder part, his butt, is going to be toward the utmost sea. That's the Mediterranean. And his stink, okay, that means they're going to die, okay? They're going to lay there and rot. And his stink shall come up, and his ill savor, oh my, shall come up because he hath done great things. Who's he? Satan in his role as Antichrist. He hath done great things with his locust army. He did great things, all right, my friend. Great, big, bad things. Okay, that's what he did. Things like he pretended to be God standing on Mount Zion. Oh, not good. And he is the one, don't forget this, that brought that locust army against our people. And he needs his butt kicked right here. And he's going to get it. And we know that this, we know what this stink is. It's prophesied and found in Ezekiel 39 and verse 11. It's when the great northern army, the locust army, led by Satan and his role as Antichrist, he's coming out of southern Russia, moving south, and he invades Israel. It's right there in your scripture. And verse uh, 11 in Ezekiel 39 says, and same time, same thing. It shall come to pass in that day. Well, what day is that? It's the day of the Lord. Special day. That I will give unto Gog, G-O-G, a place thereof, the graves in Israel, the valley of the passengers on the east of the sea, and it shall stop, or stink up, okay, the noses of the passengers and they shall, and there shall they bury Gog and all his multitude, and they shall call that burial place the Valley of Hangman Gog. Now I'll get into more of that in the next lecture, but that's what it's called. And Hangman Gog simply means the multitude of Gog. But I still haven't told you what Gog is, okay? Gog is the heathen nations that have always treated God's people, Israel, all right, terribly, and that are still treating them terribly right here in the end of the age of flesh. That's who Gog is. That's the multitude of Gog. Not all the nations are there, but the ones who are not friendly to God's people, they're there, and they're going to get buried right there. Verse 21. God speaks to the land, okay, and then He's going to speak to us. He said there, he said, I'm jealous for two things. You part my land. I gave it to Abraham. It goes all the way from the, the Nile River on, in Egypt. It goes all the way north, northeast to the Euphrates River. It's a big piece of land. He said, you've parted my land. Well, when Israel went back in 48, they got a small portion of that. Then in 67... There was another war. They took Jerusalem. Then in 73, they took all of the Sinai. They took it all. And they, took, and, and they took the Golan Heights. And they were moving toward recovering all the ground that God had promised Abraham. But there was a problem. Man steps in. And he wants to negotiate peace. Okay? So he did. And every time Israel negotiates peace, the land gets smaller. And it gets smaller. And they gave back 
all of the Sinai. Now, our current commander in chief has just declared this year, 2020, that the Golan Heights does belong to Israel. I'm thankful for that. You know, so there's some good things going on. But the problem here is the land got parted. God's not happy about it. And his people got treated like dirt. He's really not happy about that. So what does he tell the land in verse 21? He says, fear not, O land. Don't worry about it, Israel. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. In other words, God alone, don't miss this, is going to wipe out that northern army himself. And we ain't going to have to fire one shot. This is the final battle. Armageddon. Why will we not fire one shot? So that the heathen, the heathen nations, that do not, even to this day, believe that God is real. I'm talking about Yahovah, not some false god. will find out really, really quick just the opposite when he wipes them out all by himself. Okay? And now, here comes, and, I'll, and you tune in on the next lecture, I'll give you details on that. You'll love it. You'll love it. <clears throat> but now, here comes our instructions when we see these things come to pass. You know, we're going to see the arrival of that locust army. They're not really locusts. This study will teach you that their fallen angels and all of their follower, earthling followers that they can gather. Let me tell you, there's a lot of them. Okay? <clears throat> so, <clears throat> he tells the land, you know, fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. He's going to wipe them out. We won't fire a shot. Why? So that the heathen that do not believe, I know I'm repeating this, but I'm doing it on purpose, that God is real will find out real quick just the opposite. And so now here comes our instructions. He just instructed the land. Okay, And you may think that's strange, but uh, my wife and I, our family business is real estate business, building and uh, homes, commercial and residential, all of our lives since we, we've been married 49 years almost. That's been our business. But you know, land will talk to you. It really will. If you just pull up and look at a piece of land and just sit there and listen, Ideas will start coming to you. I'm just telling you, land will talk to you if you sit there long enough and listen. Verse 22, our instructions, when we see these things coming to pass, verse 22, read it with me. Be not afraid. Well, that's pretty direct. I like it. But that isn't what I hear much of watching so-called prophecy teachers he said, be not afraid. Now, it's going to be kind of hard to not be afraid when you see this coming. You know, I'm sure Israel had a certain kind of fright when they saw, you know, the plagues coming down in Egypt, though they weren't touching them. I'm sure there was some fear involved. And I think this is why he's telling us this. Be not afraid. I know you're going to be tempted to, but don't do it. You don't have to. In other words... Don't get shook when you see these things come to pass. Be not afraid. Finish the verse. You beast of the field. For the pastures, listen to this, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring. That means they still spring forth. For the tree beareth her fruit. The fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. And how do they yield their strength? When God's involved, my friend, I'll tell you how. In great abundance. That's our God. Amen. This lets you know right off the bat that the locust army are not actually locust. Okay? Because if they were, it would have, they would have destroyed the fields. But they didn't. In other words, we're not going to have a system that will rob you of your earthly wages or work. Each person will enjoy the fruit of his or her labor, so forget what men say, okay? And listen to what Yahovah says, okay? And be not afraid. He said, I didn't say this. He said this. I like it too. Concerning this time. So, <clears throat> 
If you're not afraid, then what are you? Look at verse 23. He said, be glad then. Wow. Be glad who? Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For He hath given you the former rain moderately, and He will cause future tense, but we're close to it, to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. Ooh, that's good. Now think farming with me right here <clears throat> to start with. We're going to go spiritual here in a second, but right now let's just think farming, okay? The former rain for a farmer, or sometimes called the early or the spring rain, is the rain that germinates the seed and the latter rain matures the crop and the fruit in the field. It takes both of them. You got to have both. And spiritually speaking, <clears throat> that former rain of the Spirit fell on Pentecost Day some 2,000 years ago that germinated the seed of the Word of God. Okay? And Jesus said, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And you know what? When, the, when that early church in Acts 2 got filled with the Spirit, man, when they sowed that word, that word germinated. They turned the world upside down with it. <clears throat> but on the first day of the five-month period, that greater double portion of the Holy Spirit will be poured out. He said, I shall do it on God's people. And this late reign of the Spirit will cause, listen closely, rapid acceleration of learning and understanding in the form of knowledge, the knowledge of God. Unlike you've ever seen before. It's a supernatural thing. So that the seed that has been planted and, gener and germinated all along before that can come forth, but not just come forth, but can come forth quickly and bear fruit quickly. Supernatural. Mm -mm -mm. Come to fruition in a very short time. Five months. And that's going to happen for many, many people. It's not going to happen for just a few folks. It's going to happen for many, many people. Quite possibly into the billions. Because the spiritual growth and harvest of people will be so great at that time that the prophet Moses or Amos said in Amos 9 and verse 13 that the plowman shall overtake the reaper. Oh, what does that mean? That means this spiritual harvest that's going to come out of this five month period would be like a, uh, like a corn harvest if you want to compare it to that, that started at the end of the five months, but it was so big, it went through September, October, November, December. They're still harvesting January, February, March, April. Time to plant again, and they're still reaping corn. And here come the sowers. Hey, you guys need to get out of the way. Can't get out of the way, dude. We're still bringing it in. <laughs> now that's a big harvest, and that's what that verse means. And that's what God said was going to happen. Glory to God. Mm, 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 mm. And God, now listen to this. And God has called some, are you listening to me out there, to plant those seeds of truth now that germinate even now. And certainly they will then. So, don't get discouraged, my friend, with your seed sowing. You just keep laying it right on in there. You know what? They may be offended with some of it. That's okay. The seed got thrown on the ground. God will determine when it comes up. 
One sows. One waters. But Yahavah gives the increase. Not everybody's got the same time. It's okay. But they will have a time. They will have to make a decision. It will happen. Don't stop sowing. Keep sowing. Keep sowing. I'm not telling you to be a religious nut job. Nobody wants one of them. I don't want to be around a religious nut job. Nobody does. Okay? I know a few, but I don't go around them. All right? But I do sow seed. You know, you can sow seed gently. If you have just a little bit of wisdom about you, you can say the truth without giving them chapter and verse. And sometimes that's all they need. You know what? Sometimes all they need is a smile. Or a pat on the back and say, man, it's good to see you. That's called love. You can sow a little love. It'll come up. You know, they'll come back for some more. Every old cur likes to pat on the head once in a while. You know what I'm saying? Don't stop sowing. That's my point. Verse 24. <clears throat> here's what it's going to look like at your house. Now, I know you've been told something else, but look, here's what God said. And the floors woo, shall be full of wheat, and the fats shall overflow with wine and oil. And that means, my friend, there will be plenty for his election. Fear not. Be glad. Rejoice. Plenty of what? What's it going to be plenty of? Well, think with me back to Joel chapter 1. What was it? What did the locust army strip clean and bare? Was it crops? Or was it God's truth? Oh, you know the answer. They stripped the truth of God's Word away from God's people. By what? By not teaching it. By giving them two or three numbered sound bites, there's the three verses, and now what the right reverend's going to tell you what he thinks about it, and I don't mean squat. The only thing that matters is what Yahavah said about it, and you've got to do it chapter by chapter, and you've got to do it verse by verse, and you've got to keep the subject and object intact, or you don't understand it. Amen? But they stripped bare, okay, the truth of God's Word, away from His people, and it happened, go back to, to uh, Joel chapter 1, it happened because He said, drunken and lazy preachers didn't wake up, spiritually speaking, until the new wine was gone. You mean, no more wine? No! It's all gone! And guess what? It takes a while to plant grapes and tend vines takes years. Grow grapes. Crush them. Put them in fermentation. That's what makes them good. And wait, wait, wait. They only got five months here. By the time the drunken, lazy preachers wake up, they're going to realize, I ain't got time to do this right, even if I wanted to. You understand what he's telling us here. And by the time they woke up, or wake up, and sober up, you know what's happened? The devil has already stripped clean and bare the truth of the Word of God from the people of God for the most part. And you know what he replaced it with? Religious traditions of men. And they're satisfied with that. Well, he said, wrong dude. Don't listen to he said, you listen to what Yahweh said. And the people were starving to death, Amos said. He calls it the famine of the end time. But they weren't starving for food. They weren't starving for water. But they were starving, Amos said, for the lack of the Word of God being taught. But, verse 24 tells us, we are going to get all that truth back that was stolen from us. And that is one of the things that the greater glory is going to restore when it's poured out. Now, <clears throat> get ready for something really, really good. Are you ready? Are you all ready? For some, I'm ready for something really good. Remember Brother Oral Roberts? I love that man. Something good is going to happen to you. I love that. Something good is going to happen to you. <clears throat> and here comes one of the greatest promises. 
that the Father ever gave to man. And you, my friend, are going to partake and not far off. Verse 25. <clears throat> and, God speaking, I will restore. That means I'm going to make good to you the years that the locust have eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army, which I sent among you. These are the four stages of the locust that affected every single one of us. We all paid for it along the road, okay? But you must realize, okay, that God controls that locust army. He even said, He sent it. He even calls it His army. He allowed it. Why? To wake up and correct his lazy children. Well, how else is he going to do it? You know, your kid ain't acting just right. And you explain it to him, you know. Hey, he, can't, he shouldn't do that, you know. And, you, and he does it again or she does. And I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, uh, don't do that again. And then well, the next thing you know, you got to, you know, you got to put forth punishment so that it really gets in their mind. They can tell you the stove's hot. Don't touch it. But there ain't nothing like touching a cherry red hot stove to really burn it in your mind. That sucker is hot. That's what he's doing here. He don't want to do it. But his children are lazy. The preachers are certainly lazy. Not all of them. Okay. But don't ever forget this. Yeah, he's the army's coming. He sent it. It's the whole nine yards. But don't ever forget this. Don't ever forget that he gave you power beforehand to be able to control it in your own life in the name of Jesus and by the authority of Jesus Christ. He has given us all power and all authority over all of our enemies and your documentation for that, and I forgot to put it up here, is Luke chapter 10 and verse 19. So, if you're ready for that, then it don't matter. you got power over them. But not only that, God has also promised. Now, I know a lot of you have suffered a lot of loss in your life. You know. <laughs> but God has promised you that He will make good on all of your and our sufferings all of your and our wounds, all of your and our casualties and our losses from the years that we lived in the flesh, period, and you have your Father's Word on that. Don't ask me how He's going to do it. You know, but He said He's going to do it, and I guarantee you, He can do it. I know a lot of people, hey, you've been done wrong, I understand. You've suffered this and suffered that. You sit and you wonder, why me? But you know what? There's one in heaven. And He's keeping score. And He knows exactly what the score is in the game. And He said, I am going to make it up to you. And you've got to believe that. And when you do, you're going to have it. Verse 26. Oh, I love this one. You can look at me and tell I love this one. Here we go. And you shall eat plenty <laughs> and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God <sighs> that hath dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed. Well, you know, isn't that what happened in the Exodus? Didn't they go out every morning and there was manna on the ground? And then they complained and God sent them some quail. They had manna, that, you know, they had it all. They didn't have to work for any of it. God provided it. Why? They were in the waste howling wilderness. And God was moving Israel to someplace else. Well, that's where we're at right now. Okay? Right now, we're making it. It's all going to happen the way we're doing it. But when we get to this time, when we get to this supernatural time, we're going to need supernatural help. And he says, we're going to get it. Now, I don't know what you're believing for your, you know, your, but this is what I'm believing. Amen? That don't mean you just instantly become a blithering idiot. 
Okay? I grew up on a farm. We always had six months of food ahead because we raised our food. We can. We put it in the cellar. Na, 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 all that and this. You should have just common sense would tell you from ice storms and tornadoes and everything we go through. You should have six months of salary on hand right now. And if you don't, you better start putting back pennies, you know, a week until you can get something stored up. Because, you know, life just throws things at you. That's just common sense. You should have six months of salary put back. You should have six months worth of food put back, so on and so forth, just so you can weather natural things. But when we get to right here, I'm telling you this. I mean, you can prep all you want to, but this is a supernatural army that's coming with a supernatural leader, and we're going to get supernatural help, and it's going to be different than the help we get right now. Say amen. 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 So, and then he, he finishes this up, that hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. Now, this is very important. Because there are a lot of people who at the end of this Lord day when He returns who will be ashamed on that day. And we know they will because Jesus said they're going to call for the rocks to fall on them when they realized they worshipped a false Christ that comes before the true one does even though the Scripture plainly tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that you are going to meet Christ in a spiritual body at the seventh trump. Okay? But this five-month period we're talking about happens in the fifth and the sixth trump. Okay? And you are going to be here. And many will be deceived at that time because they don't understand the simple chronological order of events the way that the Lord laid it out for us in His Word. And you have to know that six comes before seven. And really, it ain't that hard, dude. It just ain't that hard. You know what I'm saying? But, just to stay on the safe side, if you are here when Jesus arrives... And you can still pinch an inch of flesh. Guess what, dude? It ain't him. What you've got is a Jesus impersonator. Also known as the anti or the antithesis of or the instead of the real Christ. That's what you've got. And that's the way it's coming down. Verse 27. And you shall know, not maybe, that I am in the midst of Israel. Okay? Not somewhere floating around someplace. Not above. But he said, I am in the midst, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else. Well, isn't that what happened in the Exodus? He was right there. His presence was right there. And my people, he said, two times for emphasis, shall never be ashamed. Two times. Again. Why will they not be ashamed? Because God's people know the difference between the true and the false. You know, there's a lot of fake news going on today. You know? And if you don't know the difference between the true and the false, you can get deceived just on that stuff. But this is a lot bigger than that stuff. Trust me, it's a lot bigger. Amen. Verse 28. Now watch this. He gets real direct here. I hope you're enjoying this. It probably ain't going along with a lot of stuff you've heard all your life. But you've got to keep in mind, this is God talking. So, you know, wherever you want to put Him. I know where I put Him. At the top. Verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward. After that five months starts. Okay? <clears throat> that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. And your young men shall see visions. And not maybe. This is going to happen with that great latter day outpouring of His Spirit and glory. And we do know from Job 
chapter 33, and I'd like for you to turn there right now. Job chapter 33. Those of you who are new to the Bible, that would be Job chapter 33. Same thing. <laughs> <clears throat> you're going to learn from this chapter that God does visit men and women, boys and girls, through dream and vision. He does. To do what? Very specific. He says to seal their instruction. Now you got to understand that greater glory has been dumped out. You know, locust armies on the ground. We need, we need intelligence. We need information. I need to know what to do here, God. If you want to use me, blah, 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 all that. He, he visits them in, in dream and vision and seals their instruction. So in Job 33, I'm going to take just a brief look at dreams and visions because these types of communications between God and man have taken place all through the Bible, both Old and New Testament. And right here at the end of the fifth trump, going into the sixth, I will promise you that the Father is going to visit His children, both men and women, boys and girls, in dream and vision, more than He ever has in the past. So you need to know just a little bit about this because God said He will pour out His Spirit <clears throat> on all flesh. Let me ask you a question. Are you flesh? Then you qualify. Here we go. Job 33 and verse 14. For God speaketh once, yea, two times, yet man perceiveth it not. You see, through the course of the day, the Lord could be speaking to your spirit. But many times we're so busy with work and responsibilities, we're all guilty of it, that we are not sensitive to His voice and we don't hear Him. In other words, we perceiveth not. Okay? So what might the Lord do? Verse 15. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men and women in slumberings upon the bed. Verse 16. Then He, God, openeth the ears, that's your spiritual ears, of men and women, and sealeth their what? Their instruction. As Dr. Zulu would say, Oh my... Yeah, God's talking to you here, okay? And when the Father instructs you, now, I'm not talking, I'm not telling you I read this in some book. I've lived this my whole life since childhood, okay? When the Father instructs you, one of four things is going to happen to you, or perhaps all four could happen to you in one visitation. Number one, here's the first thing that's going to happen to you. He is going to inspect you. That's the first thing you're going to get. And after inspection, if you need it, He will give you the second thing you need. The second reason is He will correct you. And if you take the correction, and you better... Then he will give you number three, and number three is he gives you his direction. Ooh. And when you step out on his direction, then he's going to give you number four, which is his protection. Mm -mm. And the whole thing about dream and visions is all about servanthood. It's all it's about. You and my servant God. Now, when God instructs you, okay, you may very well see it play out the next day or perhaps the next week or two. <clears throat> but, okay, there's always a but, right? The fact 
that he says he sealeth our instructions can mean, all right, that it may not play out and you may not understand it until many years later. And from my own personal experience, when I was 15 years old, I had two very long and very detailed prophetic dreams about the end times. And I had both dreams during Israel's six-day war of 1967, when Israel took back possession of the holy city, Jerusalem, after not having that for 1,897 years. It was a big deal. And the only thing I understood at the time was, I knew it was the Almighty Himself showing me something. You don't have to ask when He shows up. And He was showing me something very important, the kind of thing you can't forget, even though I didn't understand it. I didn't understand any of it. And it would be some 40 years later, before I would understand what he was showing me in 1967, and that has to do with God's timing in a, person, in a person's life. That was timing for me. And in this particular case, and I may be talking to somebody out there right now, you've been living with these for a while, you stay with me. In this particular case, I would have to understand in his time, of course, all right, what he showed me in order to fulfill the call that he placed on my life to teach his word. In other words, at age 15, he sealed my instructions for another time. He did it to Daniel. Again, <clears throat> it can be a quick turnaround on a dream or a vision, or brother, it can be a long one. That's up to the Father. Okay. Again, what are those four reasons why Yahovah visits His sons and daughters in dream and vision? And I'm going to give you a primo example of a very famous person that got all four in one visit. Are you ready? Look at verse 17, Job 33, 17. Reason number one, that he may withdraw man from his purpose. Oh, this, my friend, is your inspection. Whose purpose you working here, brother? Yours or mine? Now watch. In Acts chapter 9, when Saul, whose name was later changed to Paul, was on his way to Damascus to persecute the early church, Christ appeared to Saul in a vision and knocked him to the ground and said to him, Saul, Saul! Why do you persecute me? What's happening here? The Lord is inspecting Saul's purpose. He's looking at it hard. Again, verse 17, that he may withdraw man from his purpose. Reason number two, here it comes, and hide pride from man. And Saul said back to Israel's Messiah, Okay? Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And I'm sorry, but that had to be a real pride buster for old Saul, who was a renowned Old Testament biblical scholar who should have known who he was. But he didn't know. In fact, he didn't know, and he was having Christians uh, persecuted. That's how wrong he was. So he got inspected. He got his purpose checked. Then, you know, he went to number two. He had to deal with his own self-pride. You know, this will happen to you in dreams. You've got to watch for it. Watch for these four things. Verse 18. That's all for your benefit, by the way. Verse 18. And reason number three for dreams and visions. He keepeth back his or her soul from the pit. In the Hebrew, this word pit is ditch. Have you ever found yourself in one of life's ditches? Off the main road? Not working God's purpose, but your own? 
And Saul trembling said, Lord, what would you have me to do? Oh, and there it is. Reason number three, old Saul is going to get direction. New direction. God's direction this time. It's all coming through a vision. Verse 18. He keepeth back his soul from the pit. And reason number four, watch this. <clears throat> and his life from perishing by the sword. And reason number four is God's protection over your life. And <clears throat> as you go through the book of Acts, you see very plainly that Paul certainly had that divine protection. But he got inspected, okay? And he went down through the gamut and he, and he yielded to God and he became, you know, he wrote most of the New Testament. So yes, when this latter-day great outpouring of God's Spirit on all flesh happens, just expect the Father to instruct you through the avenues of dream and or vision. Now, I know there are many, many people who have never had a dream or a vision from God. And if that's you, don't sweat that. Don't sweat that for one second. Why? Because it is the Father who knows what you need and when you need it. Till then, enjoy the peace and quiet because contact, my friend, is going to involve spiritual warfare. That's where you're going. And in this case, no news is good news, okay? So just enjoy it while you can. Now back to Joel chapter 2 and verse 29. And we'll wrap this message up. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaidens in those days while I pour out my spirit. He ain't going to miss nobody. What days is he talking about? The days just prior to the return of Christ. The five months. Verse 30. And I will show wonders in, in the heavens <coughs> and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Well, now where have we seen this before? Okay, Where have we seen these, one you, these wonders before? You see God showing these same wonders at Israel's exodus from Egypt. And you see them at Mount Sinai when the Father shouts down the commandments to Israel. And God uses these wonders in two ways. Okay? On one hand, they bring judgment to the unrighteous, like He did to Egypt and Pharaoh. On the other hand, they bring God's glory to the righteous. Okay? Like He did for Israel and Moses. Oh, and when we see these wonders... And we shall see them. We will be at our exodus from the age of flesh. And we're headed into the promised land of our eternal existence. Verse 31. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And this sets the time for you. When does this happen? Just listen to Matthew 29, 24, verse 29. Jesus speaking, and He says, immediately after the tribulation of those days. And what days is He talking about? He's talking about that five-month period of the locust army. Immediately after the pressure of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall, shine, shall fall from heaven, and, and what does a star equal? It, weak, it weak, I'll get it out. It equals it weak, an angel, right? Fallen angels. And the powers of heaven shall be shaken. It's okay. I'm all right. I'm okay. <laughs> wow! What Jesus just said there sounds just like Joel 2, 31. And it sounds like it because it is just that. Jesus is quoting the prophet Joel. Verse 32, And it shall come to pass, not maybe, that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord. Look at that. It's all large caps in your Bible, isn't it? Isn't it all large caps? should be. When it's in large caps, you know what that means? That means the word Lord there, English word, in the Hebrew it's Yahovah. Now listen, I'm going to read it the way it reads in the Hebrew. 
And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of Yahovah, the Eternal, our Father, shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord Yahovah hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord Yahovah shall call. So he's calling them, and we're calling them. And we'll call them when we're led up before councils and synagogues to bring a testimony against that system. It'll happen. We're working in conjunction with the Father here. And who is this remnant? It's God's election. Those who plant seeds of truth, those with spiritual eyes to see and spiritual ears to hear, those who recognize the time, those who recognize the season that we're living in. And I'm talking spiritual time here, you understand. And that is you, my friend. If it is you, if this is who you are, let me ask you a question. Have you always known, deep down in your heart, okay, there had to be more to God's Word and to His plan than you've been taught? There had to be more than what the church service I just left had to do with. If that's you, then you are probably part of that remnant. But, just knowing that is not enough, my friend. I knew that for years. And you know what? I didn't know what to do with that. I left organized religion many, many years ago because I knew there was more to what you know, I knew in my heart there was more to God's plan than what I was getting. But I want to ask questions. I got no answers. So I give up on it. Bye-bye. You know, I went fishing. I really enjoyed that, you know. I'm going to say this again. If that's you, you are probably part of that remnant. But just knowing that is not enough, my friend, to make the cut. It's time now to get into Father's Word, chapter by chapter and verse by verse, whereby you keep the subject and the object in place so you can see clearly what the Father said and what He wants out of you. That's what makes the cut. And nobody's perfect. You're not going to do everything perfect. I mean, look at me. I'm the world's example. I can't do it perfect, okay? But He works with you. That's the point. He works with you. He's looking at my heart. He's looking at your heart. But you've got to get off your dead uh, and work at it. Okay? You've got to work at this. Now, maybe you can't find a church to go where you hear those things. Okay. You can tune in here, can't you? I'm here every week. I promise you, I'll take you through the whole thing. You know, and uh, I'm not going to ask anything of you. Freely it was given to us, freely we give. So tune in. You may still want to attend your church. That might be great. Pray and ask God. Just because I left the fellowship, that's no sign that you should. You see, sometimes God leaves people, those who hunger and thirst after truth, sometimes, you know, He leaves them in those fellowships. Why? To plant seed in there. You have to talk to the Father about that. Now, He wanted me out because I got driven into the waste howling wilderness where I had a whole bunch of lessons to learn and I wasn't going to learn them in Sunday school, let me tell you. Okay? I had a different call. But however He does it, whether you just tune in here and get word or if you've got another avenue to get it, fantastic, as long as you're getting it. Okay? But if you're sitting in a dry, dead church somewhere and you're not getting it, you need to make a change. Time is running out. Have you watched the news lately? You can see it. Amen. And you know what? When you finally get into Father's Word and what He actually said, I'm going to tell you, 
It'll drive out the religious traditions out of you. <clears throat> It'll drive out religious traditions of men and old wives' tales that get peddled to God's people as truth. Thank you, Sister Sherry, for that one. I really enjoyed it. I used it. There you go. It was true. And you know what it does? It eliminates churchy activity. You know, you, just because you're busy in church, that's no sign you're productive. You're just doing churchy stuff. Ooh, she's doing churchy stuff, churchy stuff. That churchy stuff's fine. But not if you're not getting the word. You're wasting your time. <sighs> well, anyway, it'll eliminate churchy activity. And you know what it'll replace it with? It'll replace it with the hard truth of our Father's word and His plan. And then you know what? And then doing that truth and doing His plan in your own personal life. Don't wait and let some organization do the work of God. Do it in your own life. You want to be blessed? Do His work. You want to have more? Do His work. You want to have protection? Do His work. You want to have peace and joy? Do His work. Don't lay it off to somebody else. That, my friend, if you do those things, that will produce the kind of spiritual fruit that our Father's looking for. Because that fruit, my friend, is eternal. And turning just one seed, sowing one seed and turning just one soul to the kingdom of God. If you just get one your whole life. Okay? That is the single greatest thing you will ever do in your lifetime. Period. So sound the alarm. Okay? Before that great and notable day of the Lord. So that you won't be ashamed. Be one who will stand and use the authority that God has given you to fight the negative and the satanic powers that we see in the world today. This five month period, my friend, is coming and it's not far off. So what has Yahweh, not some man, what has Yahweh told us his children, to expect through this five months, let's recap, shall we? He told us, say it with me, be not afraid. For the pastures of the wilderness do spring forth. The tree bears a fruit, the fig tree and the wine yield the strength. How? In abundance. So if we're not supposed to be afraid, then what are we? So be glad then, he said, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For He will give you that greater glory in those days ahead. Your threshing floors shall be full of wheat, and the fat shall overflow with wine and oil. And there will be plenty. That's what Yahovah said. Both in substance and in truth. You're going to get them both. And we shall never Never, never be ashamed. Not ever. Let's just thank Him right now. You're sitting there in your house. This resonates with you. Just lift your hand right now and say, Thank you, Father. God, thank you, Lord. Bless you, Almighty God. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your son. Thank you for your plan. Amen. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this lecture today. It should have answered some questions for you. So, and if you did enjoy it, hey, send us a card or a letter and let us know. We can't wait to hear from you. Just address it to Dove Point, Box 272, Saginaw, Missouri, 64864. We love reading your testimonies. They are great. And hit that subscribe button for us. Won't you do that? And listen to this. Do not miss the next lecture. You miss the next one. You miss the whole story. Okay, you don't want to miss it. Because we are going to look at the demise yay, and the end of the locust army, the why, the where, the how, and the when. So don't miss it.
same bat time, same bat channel. Till next time, my friends, shalom and shalom.